A little while ago, a Raspberry Pi had announced they collaborated with Lego to make a hat that will allow Raspberry Pi to interface with Lego hardware. Obviously, this was quite exciting to lots of us, the idea that we can bring the full power of Raspberry Pi to our Lego projects. So I ran straight out, ordered one, I had to wait for them to come available in into Australia, but I was pretty happy when they finally arrived and I got to play with my Lego hat. So I have here um, a Raspberry Pi 4, and I've mounted my Lego hat on top of the Raspberry Pi 4 with using a stackable header, because that allows the pins to poke through the hat, and it means I can use, still use all the Raspberry Pi features while the hat's on it, and I can use these ports here for all the Lego hardware. So the idea will be this Raspberry Pi 4 and this Lego hat will replace the, the hub, and I won't need the hub anymore, and I'll be able to run all my Lego stuff off these ports and all my Raspberry Pi off, this, off these ports, and I'm just going to be powering it with a two-cell LiPo battery. Uh, Raspberry Pi does make an official battery for it, but any two-cell LiPo will run it, and that's one I already happen to have around. So one thing I did find when choosing an OS, um, just before this video came out, there was a new operating system release called Bullseye. And what I found is when I used Bullseye, I had lots of intermittent problems with the hat. Sometimes it'll work, sometimes it wouldn't work. But as soon as I switched back to the previous version, the legacy version, Buster, with desktops and security updates, everything worked quite fine. What you might find is after Bullseye's been out for a little bit, there'll be a number of updates and Bullseye might work quite well, but at the time of making this video, I had problem with Bullseye and I found Buster worked much better for me. Righto, time to write the first bit of code and test. I have the big motor here attached to uh, port D and I have the color sensor here attached to port C. I'm gonna write some simple code here. I'm gonna import time, import build hat, um, I'm going to make an instance of the um, big motor in port D called big motor. I'm going to make an instance of the color sensor called color sensor. And then I'm just going to simply run the big motor for three seconds. So you'll see the big motor turn for three seconds just to test we can do that. I'm going to set a variable called count to 20. I'm going to take the time we start this loop. I'm going to go around this loop for however many times count is set to. Each time around the loop, I'm just going to print out the value that's coming, the reflected light intensity that's coming off the color sensor. Then when I'm finished, I'm gonna set period equal to the current time minus the start time. So the length of time it's taken to go around this loop that many times. Then I'm gonna divide it by how many times it went around so I know what the period is for each loop. Then I'm gonna print out that period to two decimal places. Then I'm also gonna print out the frequency, which is one over the period. So let's give them a run, see what we get. You can see the motor turns nicely. After the motor's finished turning, we can put it on here. We can see when I go over black, I get a really low reading. When I go over white, I get a really high reading. You'll also notice that it's very slow to update. And in fact, it takes 0.6 of a second to read the uh, color sensor, which is a frequency of only 1.67, all right? So really poor, really poor rate at which we can read the sensor. So I've decided to test the rest of the sensors. So at the moment I still have the big motor hooked up to port D, the color sensor to port C, but I actually have the ultrasonic sensor to port B and the force sensor to port A so I can test them all. And I've wrote a pretty simple program, same thing importing the build hat. This time I make an instant of all the sensors, the big motor, the color sensor, the ultrasonic sensor, the force sensor. This time to get more accurate, I did more loops, 100 loops this time instead of 20. The same time, taking the start time, going around it, this time here, instead of printing to the screen, I'm just gonna store it in a variable, which is normally faster than printing to the screen because it's just right into the memory. And I'm gonna read the position of the big motor. All right, then I'm gonna calculate the period, print out the period and the frequency. And I'm gonna do the same again, this time for reading the color sensor, write out the reflected light intensity of the color sensor. The same thing again for reading the ultrasonic sensor, getting the distance, printing it out. And then one last time here 
to read the force sensor going around printing it out. When I ran this code, this is the result I got down here. To read the motor position, it's about 0.2 of a second and you get a frequency of like five times per second. The color sensor is definitely the, the slowest sensor to read and you can only read it just over once per second. The uh, distance sensor again was at a frequency of five times per second and the force sensor were five times per second. If you're gonna build a fast moving competition robot, what will happen is that the robot will move too far when it's going fast if you're reading sensors at such low frequencies, right? And it's also slowing down your code, the fact that your code is stopped waiting for this sensor to be read before coming back. So yeah, very, very slow reading sensors here. So one thing I did really wanna do with this video, show off the power Raspberry Pi can bring to your projects. So a really good thing that Raspberry Pi does very well and quite easily is basic computer vision. And of course you can't do, Lego can't do computer vision. So what I've done is I've added a Raspberry Pi camera, right? I have had to make up a little mount for it. All I did was I just drew that up on my computer and I laser cut that out of acrylic. You can 3D print it if you want. And I've also added some addressable RGB LEDs, quite often referred to as NeoPixels. So I'll put one down the back here, and that's just gonna be an indicator. It's just gonna go red, orange, green, and then the robot's gonna drive off, and it's gonna change different colors to indicate the computer vision seeing different things. And I've also ran off that one, I've chained in three pixels up here at the top there. Instead of lighting them up color, I'm gonna I'm going to program, program them to light up white, to be lighting down there. Because one thing you want with computer vision is consistent lighting. If I'm driving around on the ground and a shadow's being cast down to where the camera's looking, the shadow upsets your computer vision. So you always want nice backlighting with your computer vision projects. All right. So I've spent the day writing my computer vision algorithm and optimizing it to run as fast as possible. And I'm getting it to update about 80 frames a second now. So very fast updates, which makes it very easy for a fast moving robot to be able to stay on the line. Now what we have here is this very first box here is the actual feed coming off the camera. The next box here is where I've thresholded it out. I'm looking for the black line. So what I said is any pixel in this image that's darker than a certain amount, I'm gonna set it to true. All other pixels are gonna turn set to false. This one here is where I draw a contour around all the true pixels. And this here is where I draw a minimum bounding box around the contours, all right? So we find if we come over here to the intersection, as we go up to the intersection, I need to have a very large box to get around the contours. So you see the size of the box here, I'm printing out the size of the box just here. You have a very large box. When I get off the line, you get a much smaller box. So I know any time I hit an in intersection is because the size of my minimum size box becomes very large. And if I'm looking over here, say, the error is how far the center of this box is from the center of the image. Right, so as it goes further out to the left, the error here becomes more and more negative, more and more negative, more and more negative. When it's in the dead center, the error will be zero. If I can get it in the center here, pretty hard. Just on right, just near there somewhere, on zero. And as it goes further out to this side, the error becomes positive. So the error is how far the center of this box is away from the very center of the image. But the angle tells you the angle of the box. So when the box comes off here and starts becoming shooting out towards the left, I get a negative angle. And the more it shoots towards the left, the bigger the negative angle. And of course, if it's shooting towards the right, I get a positive angle. And of course, the bigger it gets, the more the bigger the angle, the, the more the positive it gets. So what happens is the error tells me how far we are off the center, but the angle tells me what the future trend is. So if it's like this, Although the line is off to the left and has a negative error, the angle is positive. What the angle does is tells you what the future trend is. So we can look from the top camera looking down, we can see that the, the line is definitely off to the left, 
But we can also see if we don't do any turning, the future trend is to come on. Now, if the line is just off to your left, you'd think the robot actually needs to turn left. But if the robot turns left, it will find the line quicker, but it'll come on the line at a really bad angle and overshoot. So what we actually want to do when the line is off to the left, we need to have a look at this angle to know what the future trend is. Because the future trend is positive, what we actually want to do is when we come in here, we actually want to start to straighten it up till it comes into the center. All right, so these are the three pieces of information I have. The error, how far it is off, the angle, what the future trend is, and the size of the bounding box will let me know where I have my turn. And again, you can just see when I move this around how fast this is updating. You literally can't read it. Yeah, I'm getting 80 for over 80 frames a second. Okay, I've wrote a little program to test the motor control. Um, I've just simply imported build hat and time. I've created an instance of motor pair and I've called it drivetrain. And of course, one motor's in port A and the other motor's in port B. I'm just simply gonna to print to the screen, move forward, and then I'm just simply gonna get give it the command to start driving forward at 50% power. Now, left wheel actually needs to go backwards because it's on the other side of the robot, flipped up the other way up. Right, then I'm just gonna wait for two seconds, then I'm print move backwards, and then put the drivetrain in reverse, then I'm gonna wait for two seconds, then I'm print stop, and stop the drivetrain. All right, we're gonna run this program now. So a couple of things I want you to notice is I have the robot lined up to pretty much go straight down this little line you can just see. Um, I also want you to notice when the print forward comes here and when the robot starts moving, I also want you to notice that one wheel starts moving well before the other wheel. So let's have a quick look at that. All right, we can see the latency and the uneven between the starting of the two wheels. Okay, that last video I've recorded, I've put into my video editing software where I can move it one frame at a time and see what happens. We're gonna see when this print move gets printed and then how long after that before the robot actually starts moving. So if I start going through here a little bit, you'll find at 0.18, we haven't appeared yet. We go 0.19, it goes move forward. Now let's see how many frames and how long we go before the robot actually starts moving. There, the robot hasn't moved, 0.110, nearly a full second. 0.111, you can see between 0.110 and 0.111, this bottom wheel starts moving, but the top wheel hasn't started moving yet. Bottom wheel starts moving, gets a head start, gets a head start for a few frames, and then just there, the second wheel starts moving. All right, so we're talking nearly a complete full second from when the command is executed and the robot starts moving. If we go forward a couple of seconds, do we find when the, oh, move backward. So there we don't have a move backward at two seconds, 0.17. I go on a little bit, we get moved backward at two seconds, 0.18, and you'll find pretty much straight away, the robot stops, the robot then sits still for a bit, it's not till we get to nearly a full second later, just there. The bottom, again, only one wheel starts moving, and then a little bit, the second wheel starts moving. So you can see we have a latency of a full second between when the drivetrain, when, between when the Raspberry Pi asks the Raspberry Pi hat to start moving the motors and when the Raspberry Pi hat actually moves it, a full second of latency. Well, that was a bit of a showstopper for us, wasn't it? Um, if I can only update the motors once per second and one wheel starts moving well before the other wheel, there's no way I can make a fast moving, accurately steering robot. Um, so it means that the Raspberry Pi hat in its current form would only be suitable for projects that handle very high latency. Um, I think one positive note we can say is I don't think it's a hardware problem with the hat. 
I think the latency is actually in the firmware, which means later on it's possible that Raspberry Pi might bring out an update for the firmware and then these latency issues might be fixed. Um, but for the moment, for me, you know, the Raspberry Pi hat's going to go back in the drawer 